Are you ready for this one, Tim? We've been, we've been talking as usual for three hours about everything in the world, and now we have to record a podcast, and I have no idea what to do for the intro. Three, two, one. Three, two, one, <laughs> podcast. Anyone who listened to the last episode will know that we had to abort halfway because of a technological glitch. Oh, God. Does a whole, has a whole year gone by already? I can't mm-hmm. believe it. Coming up so fast. It has become a real calendar event. Mm-hmm. And it obviously makes sense as the start and end of a year because summertime is the start and end of the year. And January yeah. is a dumb time to do the start and the end of the year. What's going on this year? I've got like a list app on my phone. And since we started the podcast, I've just been using that one app. So ideas I had from like pretty much before we even started are still sitting on that list down the bottom. And I just add new ideas to the top all the time. So the more you scroll down, the more you'll find my old ideas. And this was one of my oldest ideas. So here's the thing. I'm going to totally back up journaling. Although part of the problem is if you're trying to establish habits, is that journaling in and of itself is a kind of habit. You know, there's there's a little bit of like a feedback loop that's going on here. But whenever I do go through, because I, I don't journal consistently. I always I always want to be journaling more. And when I do do it, the phrase that always leaps to my mind is like, I am angry at how effective it is mm-hmm. because, it, because it is such a simple tool. And so I, I tend to use it in, in bursts and, and then I sort of fall away from it for a little while. So I'm, I'm not super consistent with it. But yeah, if, if you're trying to keep a, an idea in your mind and you want to try to trigger thoughts before something happens... If journaling is a kind of habit that you can maintain, then I think there is perhaps nothing better that you could possibly do to set it up that like, I'm going to visit this every day and I'm going to have a system of accountability and I'm going to do all these things. If like me, you may, you're either inconsistent with the journaling or you just feel like that's not a habit that you could sustain while you're trying to do something else. I would suggest for this, that I might just literally print out your theme and put it somewhere where you're going to see it more obviously. Let me just give you one idea before we talk about others. You release, not as a podcast, but you just release as a file, one half of a podcast recording. Because obviously you and I do this remotely. So there's you hear me talking and then there's a blank space yeah. while you're talking. Sure. And then I talk and then there's a blank space while you talk. And then I add you into the blank spaces later. Just merge the two files. What you do here is you will just release just me talking with the blank spaces. And then people fill in the gaps themselves. They pretend they're doing the podcast and they guess at what's being said at the other end Mm. and try and make it fit into the blank spaces. Oh, that's a great idea. So they kind of construct the other half of the podcast from their imagination and you could have different people doing it in different ways and you see how all different people interpret it you could listen to some of those versions ultimately you could then release the actual version like an improvisation game in a way or improvisation project or creative project for people to construct the second half of a podcast that's a great idea i like that the the only thing i'm going to say though is I do think if you're going to do this, it's actually quite important to move or change it on a somewhat regular basis. And responses like someone going, oh, my God, that's unbelievable. And you're thinking, oh, my God, what's happened? What's unbelievable? And you start to think, has someone died? Is it good news? Is it bad news? Like, yeah. Yeah, because you can just become totally blind to it. You know, it becomes invisible after a little while. You just you don't really notice it. Because again, I always think of this as, as like in, in productivity, there's this thing about the Hawthorne effect, which is sim- simply changing almost anything increases productivity. Hmm. Um, but then there's a half-life to that. And so uh, if you're going to have something that you can visually see, I would move it around so that you don't become visually blind to it. <laughs> you're right. That's 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 one way to look at it. You're kind of reconstructing the other half of the, of a conversation, except you're doing it with a podcast. There are different ways you could do this, right? You could take the half a conversation and give it to someone else who's like, you know, of prominence, you know, like a guest and say, here's your project for the next week. Make the other half of this conversation. And like today we're looking at how Tom Hanks has reconstructed the other <laughs> half of this conversation. Yeah. Or you could just make it like, 
lots and lots of people can do it and everyone does it differently. And then you get all these weird takes. Someone might make it a conversation with an alien. Some might treat it really normally. But yeah, you've got to you've got to come back to it. And that's that's really the key. And you, you can't just expect that you're going to think about it at the appropriate times. This is a te- quite a technical nerdy issue. But there is a question of when there are the gaps, like say there's a 15 second gap that I leave yeah. while you said something. Can the person who's making like the reconstruction change the length of that gap, oh. shorten it or lengthen it? Or, or do they have to leave the exact gap? I imagine that's like the extreme version is you have to leave the exact same size gap. But you could also have a cheat version where you can extend the gaps and shorten the gaps to make it sound like a conversation. And also, I always want to say this as well. Never expect perfection from yourself. <laughs> like... Why don't you buy a dedicated notebook? That's just your ideas book. This list of projects that I have should shrink. It shouldn't continue to grow over the course of the year. By the end of the year, the number of projects should be much smaller. And so trying to say like, this is never going to happen. I'm just going to close this project. You know, like, like we all do. To look at a little project that's been on the list for six months and say, you know what? I could knock this out in two hours if I just sat down and did it. And like, boom, get that thing done. And that feeds into the feeling of the year of reorders. Like, oh, having a cleaner, smaller list of projects feels more orderly and it feels better. Shall we revisit some of the ones that got lost last time? There's a number of projects. I happen to know I have a spreadsheet where I track a bunch of my videos. And I happen to notice that uh, my UK Explained video is coming up on eight and a half years old now at this point, uh, which is just like inconceivable to me that it was it was that long ago my view of careers in entertainment is that they're they're like they're like perfect storms that you know we we think of creators and people who entertain for a living like comics and actors and authors and what you have are people with particular skills but you also have to have the the weather of the broader the broader culture and the like the global audience has to match up with the thing that the person is producing and you don't have any control over that weather so like you know if you're a comic like you may be the world's the world's number one comic for a period of years but tastes and humor change and your very your very presence influences the change in taste of people. So like, I, I really think it's crazy when I talk to people in entertainment who seem to just assume that their careers will last forever. And it's like, no, no, no. The, like the very fact that you're here changes this, this weather system and makes it more likely that some new hotness is going to, going to appear that people are, are going to then be interested in. So... You know, I don't know how long my career in entertainment will last, but I've I have never expected it to to last my whole life. I think that's that's pure insanity. I don't think we have really good numbers on how long YouTube careers can last because YouTube hasn't been around that long. But, you know, it is it is a thing that's on my mind sometimes is, you know, am I still going to be making YouTube videos and podcasts when I'm in my 50s? And it's like, I don't know. That seems that seems unlikely. And so that's a thing that's a thing that I will have to start planning for more and more as time goes on. I believe you called it Absolute Veto. Was that yeah. the name? Yeah, the podcast world is longer, but I think also just like just like you can find actors who have been acting for twenty and thirty years. Can you give us an example? Who is who is an automatic veto for you? You're talking about an outlier group within an outlier group. So it's it's just, you know, like actors seem to come and go in these seasons. Yeah. And it's like, oh, and you never see this person ever again. They were in a whole bunch of movies for, you know, a few years. And then like, whoosh, dust in the wind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously we've discussed before Andy McDowell. She so often is poor in good films. It almost makes me watch the films because I think, well, if Andy McDowell's in it, Clearly, it's going to be a good film that she's terrible in. Is this because of her Netflix show? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Maybe she's so bad it makes everyone else raise their game. 
I was going to say, I feel like there's something in the weather that I should be reacting to here, but I was into Marie Kondo before she was cool. I, re- I read her book a long time ago. God, I can't remember. Someone, someone must have recommended it to me. I mm-hmm. don't know. Like it genuinely so long ago. I think I must have read it in the initial wave when it came out. My unpopular one that people are going to say that's outrageous is uh, Jeff Bridges. Yeah. I, d- I don't like Jeff yeah. Bridges in films. Again, I'm sure he's a nice guy and I know he's in some very, very loved films, but for me, you know, nah. Okay. Yeah. So I watched the Netflix show with my wife yeah. and we both loved it. Like it's, it's just fun. He just rubs me up the wrong way for some reason. I can't okay. describe it. <laughs> It was like, here, okay, here's an analogy. It's a bit like watching the Lord of the Rings movies, which I really liked. But when I was watching them, I couldn't help but think that the your average moviegoer is missing a lot of the experience here. And Marie Kondo's show sort of struck me in the same way that like, oh, I really like this. But I don't know. It, it, I was really glad that I had read the book because I feel like I really understood what she was going for in ways where she's just saying a little sentence on the, on the show. And it's like, but there's so much more, there's so much more behind this. What did you take away from the show as someone who hasn't read the book? I mean, you, you say you liked it. I'm going to watch it because I just love everything they do. 